Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we begin with chapter 1, containing the sources of sacred writings, biblical theory of creation, the formation of the worlds, the seven days of creation, the pre-Adamic man. From how to understand your Bible, a philosopher's interpretation of obscure and puzzling passages by Manley Palmer Hall, a study of the Bibles of the world, revealing one spiritual tradition. Chapter 1. The Sources of Sacred Writings In spite of human prejudice to the contrary, there is but one religion and one truth, and all the great faiths of the world are parts or fragments of the ancient wisdom. The scriptures of the world are the written records devised both to preserve and at the same time to conceal the secrets of the 49 branches of the eternal law. It naturally follows that there is a certain independence between religious writings. To understand any one sacred book completely, it is necessary to also understand all other sacred books. It has been difficult for human beings to accept this truth, and for the lack of interreligious understanding there has been very little religious understanding. Each man clinging to his own book, hugging to his heart his own fragment of the law, has believed that there is a peculiar virtue in proclaiming a part and denying the rest. Bibles, so-called, are collections of inspired writings and the recordings of ancient oral traditions. They are accumulated over immense periods of time and can usually be traced to the lore of preceding civilizations. Built up from earlier fragments, they should never be regarded as revelations in the sense of being delivered in toto to any individual by some divine being. The revelation factor is generally limited to interpretation. Some illumined individual, contemplating sacred matters, perceives some deeply concealed value, and by placing special emphasis upon this new aspect, comes to be regarded as a religious founder. Among ancient peoples, sacred writings were reserved for the contemplation of initiated priests and were not available to the laity. The priest interpreted such parts of the scriptures as applied to the problems of the occasion. The populace gathered before the temple received their spiritual instructions from initiates of the priestly orders who stood upon the porch of the holy house and solemnly expounded the laws. These priests were equipped with the keys to the spiritual allegories by which they were enabled to unlock the profounder parts of the spiritual tradition. After the decline of the mysteries, when the sacred books fell into the hands of the profane, the subtler values were lost. The Vedas, the sacred books of the ancient Aryan Hindus, appear to be the oldest of the scriptural writings and the source of most of the sacred books now venerated throughout the world. The religious traditions of the ancient Hindus are of incredible antiquity, the traditions of these people indicate that the laws and institutions of the gods were revealed to the progenitors of the Aryans in the highlands of the Himalayan mountain country nearly a million years ago. The migration of the Aryan tribes, first southward and then westward, resulted in the establishment of several sub-races and cultures. The migrating tribes carried with them the sacred traditions of their ancient gods, with the development of writing, the records pass from the memories of priests and scribes to the more permanent and impersonal medium of stone, clay, and papyrus. From the Vedas poured forth the streams of religious tradition which, flowing into various nations down through the ages, appear in the course of time as the single source of the numerous scriptural writings of the world. Great saints and sages interpreting this ageless wisdom wrote their commentaries or restated in the terms of their own day the Vedic lore and the sacred tradition. In China, La Se and Confucius were the interpreters, and their writings have become scripture. In India, Buddha was the great emissary. In Persia, it was Zoroaster. In Egypt, Akhenaten and Hermes. In Greece, Orpheus, Pythagoras, and Plato. In Syria, it was Moses and later Jesus. According to the teachings of the old initiates, 
the spiritual tradition was likened to a flame burning forever upon the altars of the gods. The flame was divided into seven flames, and these in turn were again divided into seven, and the result being 49 fires or the 49 spiritual revelations, called in the Kabbalah of Moses, the 49 gates of the law. Thus, out of the one eternal truth came forth the seven world religions, each in turn divided into seven lesser parts, all together constituting the divine wisdom. The Christian Bible is the principal sacred book of the Western world. It is usually divided into two parts and occasionally into three parts by the insertion between the Old and New Testaments of the Apocrypha, or doubtful books. The Old Testament sits forth the secret doctrine in Israel. It is a Kabbalistic book, almost unintelligible, without the assistance of certain commentaries. The New Testament derives its teachings from the Essene mystics of Syria, the Mithric cultists of Persia, the Seraphic rites of the Egyptians, the Simonian Gnostic also of Syria, and the Neoplatonism of Alexandria. The unknown authors of the Gospels were, of course, men learned in the comparative religious systems of their day. It is futile at this time to engage in speculative or controversy as to the identity of these writers. It is sufficient to say that they possessed a working knowledge of the secret doctrine, and purposefully contrived to conceal this knowledge in what is made to appear an historical narrative of the life and works of an individual. Like the Christian Revelation, the Old Testament in the Mosaic tradition sits forth under the guise of history, an elaborate metaphysical system derived directly from the older Egyptian lore, indirectly from Chaldea, Phoenicia, and India. Moses was an initiate of the secret schools of Egypt, and the Pentateuch, usually ascribed to Moses, is the surviving remnant of the most profound teaching. It is quite unlikely that the Pentateuch has descended to the present time in anything resembling its original form. There is considerable evidence that the true books of Moses were lost in the night of time. But whatever the case, it is certain that the ancient wisdom, although somewhat distorted in form, still survives in the Old Testament writings, and too, that it can be extracted therefrom with the aid of certain keys and patient illumined research. A reasonable interpretation of the biblical writings is one based upon a system of cross-reference in which all the great schools of ancient religion and philosophy are considered as one composite structure. Thus, each system is interpreted in the light of the others, as each religion has been built up from innumerable older beliefs. The understanding of these various background beliefs is absolutely essential. The gaps in one system, where the tradition has been mutilated or lost, can be filled in from other systems of similar tradition. If the work is painstakingly done, the result is a complete picture by which the student is able to comprehend the correct meaning of obscure passages and fill in perplexing vacancies. The important thing is to be sure that the building in is done from the same stream of tradition as the religion that is being reconstructed. Biblical Theory of Creation The cosmogony of the Jews is derived directly from the Chaldean and Egyptian. This is proved by any question of doubt by the discovery of cuneiform tablets much older than the Jewish Bible, which contain many of these stories set forth in the opening chapters of Genesis. It is quite possible that the Old Testament originally contained a much more amplified account of the creation, but certainly it is still possible to make much more of the book of Genesis than the average church man has accomplished. With the aid of the Jewish and Kabbalistic commentaries, Genesis is amplified into a rational account of the beginning of the universe far more vital, significant, and impressive than the accepted theological version. A great scholar observed in the last century that Christian theology, and of course he included Jewish cosmogony, was the only system believed by the more advanced races of the earth 
to insist that God made the universe out of nothing, the gods. The book of Genesis opens with a simple and dramatic statement which has been anglicized into the most impressive sentence in English literature. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This verse seemingly presents no problem, but the more a searching student thinks about it, the more fully he will realize that into ten words has been comprised a cosmic process involving hundreds of millions of years of time and innumerable complicated mysteries. Only an elaborate commentary can make this verse partly intelligible to the human mind entirely ignorant of divine and cosmic procedures. We must first define the word God as it is used in this case and throughout the first chapter of the Bible. The word in Hebrew is not God or Jah or Jehovah, but Elohim. God is a reverent but entirely insufficient word to convey the true meaning of Elohim. Most important to be considered are two facts. First, in Hebrew, Elohim is an androgynous term inferring a combination of male and female attributes. Second, the word, by its termination, is plural. Actually, therefore, the word Elohim means the male-female creators, representing a host or at least a group of powers, and not, under any condition, a single personal entity. The word, heaven and earth, are also misleading, through inadequate translation. By heaven and earth should be understood a superior and inferior condition, a separation of qualities, not a division of place. The average reader would think of the heaven as the firmament and earth as the planet, and this interpretation would destroy entirely the significance of the verse. It would be better to interpret heaven and earth as spirit and matter, or the subtle and gross. In the case of vibration or qualities of life and vitality, the words in the beginning also present difficulties. The wise student will interpret them as from that which is first, or in eternal principles, or that which was in the beginning. This leaves only the word created, and here again misunderstanding is almost inevitable. The human mind customarily conceives creation as the making of something that is new. But if we think about it, we will realize that in creating any physical thing, creation is only a new pattern made up of already existing factors. Thus, if a man creates a pitcher, he requires the aid of paints and brushes and canvas. The creation is the inward inspiration which applies these instruments for the release of the idea. Creation in this verse thus implies formation or manifestation, the arranging of ever-existing elements into new patterns to be the vehicles of purpose. With these thoughts in mind, let us read again the verse according to a fuller understanding of its meaning. From the eternal principles and essences, the androgynous creator gods manifested forth the positive and negative aspects of being. Having thus clarified interpretation, we can bring to bear upon it such commentary matter from ancient Jewish beliefs as will reveal the further significance of the verse. The Jewish mystics recognized an eternal, definitionless principle which they denominated Ansulf, the boundless. From the Egyptians, they derived the teachings that this boundless one possessed three intrinsic aspects or attributes. Being, life, and light. These three as one, and that one formless, ageless, and changeless, was the true God, whose most perfect symbol was space, the source and ultimate of all things. Periodically, according to great cycles, space calls to emerge from its own nature, primordial unity, the objectification of being, life, and light. The first manifestation was called the Opened Eye and was designated by the Kabbalist, Keter, the crown of the eternal glory. Ein Sof, the Absolute, was life in suspension. Keter, the firstborn of the Absolute, 
was life in expression. Within the nature of the Kether was manifested polarity, which is the foundation of activity. The polarities were called Abba, the father, and Ama, the mother. Abba was the positive manifestation of spirit as force, energy, and power. Ama was the negative manifestation of spirit as matter, substance, and receptivity. From the union of Abba and Ama, energy and substance was produced form. According to the Kabbalist, the Elohim or the Creator Gods were the progeny of the union of life and matter. It was the Elohim in turn moving in space who brought forth the mundane universe over which they ruled. By mundane is meant not the physical worlds but the metaphysical system of which the physical creation is the lowest or seventh part. The first manifestation or agitation was equivalent to the conception of the universe and all its parts, like the planting of a seed from which was to grow the worlds. It was the first motion in the absolute. The comparison in other religious systems checks and justifies the speculations of the Jewish mystics. In the northern Tibetan system, the meditations of Adi Buddha, universal consciousness, produces the seven Dhyani Buddhas, or the seven modes of consciousness by which the world is formed. In the teachings of the Persians, the supreme nature, Ahura Mazda, manifested the Amasha Stinta, who became the formatters of the lower worlds. In the Egyptian Hermetic teachings, the Elohim are the governors, the cosmo creators. In the ancient Egyptian system, they were the Amenon Artisifers, the servants of Ptah, who fashions the egg of the universe upon a potter's will. The Elohim are also the seven Cabrari of Simothrace, the seven rays upon the crown of the Gnostic lion, the sacred seven, the unwritten vows which together make up the name of the manifested divinity, the seven colors of the spectrum, the seven days of creation, the seven seals of revelation, the eternally reoccurring septenary, by which art, music, and physics are bound together, are the Elohim, the seven breasts that move upon the deep. The Formation of the Worlds The second verse of Genesis states, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Interpreted according to the mystical tradition, this would read, And the below, the passive aspect of being, was formless and devoid of manifested light, and darkness or oblivion filled the whole expanse. The spirits of Elohim moved, impregnated, and enlivened the essences of the negative principle. In some of the Hindu works, the motion of the Elohim is referred to as the curdling of space. Into the worlds, the seven modes of intelligence, which are the personification of the seven laws of nature, which are in turn the seven wills of the spirit, began to manifest patterns. They were the first in the nature of vortexes, called in the Sefer Zetzer, the whirlwinds. One form of this theonogic myth declares that the universe was created by the deity speaking the sacred word. Of course, the word was made up of the seven vows of the Elohim, which are together the fiat which issues as a host of living power from the lips of the Creator. In the North Asiatic tradition, the seven sons of the Eternal established their foundation in the deep, Seated in the six directions of space, six of the builders turn upon the seventh, who is placed in the center and is called the immovable. In the Kabbalah, the center is called the holy temple, the Sabbath of eternal rest, around which move the six days of creation. In the Kabbalah, the higher powers do not descend into the lower elements to ensoul the mundane diffusion, but rather cast their shadows upon the deep or the lower elements. In the teaching of Lamanism, we have a somewhat similar statement. The meditating Dhyani Buddhas dream themselves into the illusion of matter, 
causing a certain part of their own consciousness to assume the illusion of existence, though ever meditating above it. The shadows of the Elohim descending into the depths of matter result in the formation of the four levels or planes of illumination, which the old Jewish philosophers called worlds. The planes correspond roughly to the levels of spirit, mind, soul, and body in man. In each of the four worlds, the seven Elohim are reflected to become in all 28, which cause them to be associated in symbolism with the lunar month and its four weeks of seven days. The ancient Jewish priests had peculiar veneration for the moons, their faith being a lunar cult. Only the lowest of the four worlds was involved in the physical creation. This lower or fourth world was made up of seven parts or planes. The shadows of the seven Elohim, of the seven planes which make up the mundane sphere. Six are superphysical and one, the lowest, is physical. The six superphysical planes are called causal and are the source of the energies and patterns which manifest or flow into and through the seventh. The seventh and lowest diffusion of the fourth world is that which the creation story in Genesis is concerned. The unfoldment of this physical plane is according to the pattern commonly known as the Chaldean system of cosmogony. In the cosmogony of the Greeks, the material universe is brought into being by seven gods, each of whom rules over one of the seven parts of the mundane diffusion. In the Greek system, the gods are Phanes, Aranus, Kronos, Rhea, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. The mundane world consists of seven interpenetrating spheres of which six are superphysical and the lowest or seventh is physical. According to this system, the seventh or physical plane is ruled over by Hades, the subterranean god, to symbolize the physical plane as being the furthest removed from the divine energy. The Seven Days of Creation The description given in Genesis 1 verses 1 to 31 must be understood to represent the gradual development of the physical universe. The Elohim, the gods of the dawn, mold the negative substances of being into the form and pattern of the solar system, having brought the planets, including the luminaries, into objective existence. The Elohim then take up their thrones in the planetary body, and according to the Chaldean Genesis, circle about in their orbits age after age, governing with their celestial splendors, the creatures of the lower world. The pattern for the creation of our own solar system applies to all other solar systems in our universal chain. The pattern also applies to all forms of life evolving within solar systems, from suns and planets to grains of seed, electrons, and atoms. This is the Kabbalistic teaching concerning the macrocosmo and the macrocosm, or the greater and the lesser creations, each pattern according to the other. This led the Kabbalists to say, comparing man, a macrocosm, with the universe, a macrocosm, that man is a little universe and the universe is the grand man. This did not mean that the universe actually resembled man in his physical form, but rather that the same system of geometry which patterned man also patterned the world, and that the same essences, principles, and forces were in both. The Elohim says, let us make man in our own image, etc. This is, let the lesser creation be patterned after the greater creation, and be similar to it in principle. Medieval theologians insisted that the seven creative periods called days made up a week similar in time to a week of mortal calculation. This, the wisest of the ancient philosophers, always denied, insisting that the term day in Genesis referred to an age, cycle, or great period of time. Science uses such terms as period or age to signify one of the major divisions in the evolution of the earth 
and the life evolving upon it. Thus such terms as Miocene or Pliocene Age, or the Glacial Period. Modern science is of the opinion that the physical Earth has existed for more than 500 to 1,000 million years. A recent discovery of fossil remains indicates animal life upon the Earth at least 175 million years ago. When these figures are compared with the theological opinion that the Earth was created by the arbitrary will of God in the 5th millennia BC, it is apparent that science and theology come to a parting of the ways. The biblical scholar does not harbor the delusions, however, which afflict the pious and fanatical theologians who cling desperately to the jot and tittle of the revised version. There is abundant confirming evidence to indicate that the genesis given in the describes processes occurring over a period of at least a billion years, and that it describes how the creative forces of nature brought forth, subsequently, the superphysical bodies of the solar system, then the material planets, and then shifting perspective to the planet Earth, unfolding the life upon it to its present state. The descent of the Elohim with their host of spirits into a swirling mist of primordial substance and their molding of these mists into the sidereal patterns and bodies constituted the evolutionary process or the descent of spirit into matter. The unfolding of the worlds through the manifestation of ever-improving types of life or the release of consciousness through a concatenation of improving vehicles constitutes what Darwin called evolution. There is no real argument between science and religion. The difficulty is principally due to the extremely compressed description of the creative process given in Genesis. If the reader can take such a statement as, and God created, and read instead, and the forms of nature over a great period caused to manifest, most of the difficulties will be overcome. It should be clearly realized that the ancients understood by their gods, creative hierarchies, not personal beings performing sorcery in space, but rather aspects of creative intelligence gradually unfolding through their own creations. In the Egyptian rites, it is said the gods impregnated space with themselves, and then the seeds of the divine natures sprouted and grew up to form the universe. The proper attitude is to realize that divinity is evolving in and through the universal formation. Evolution is really eternal life ideating or shining through material organisms, as a light might shine through a lamp. Evolution is also, therefore, inward life building ever more perfect forms through which to express its own potentialities. The book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 24 to 26, inclusive, reveals that the ancients were fully aware of man's relationship to the animal world. In the sixth day, both the animal and the human kingdom is formed, the animal manifesting first, and finally man, created in the image or likeness of the Elohim. The first part of verse 26 requires special emphasis, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Then in the last part of the 27th verse, it says, male and female created he them. This is a very confused picture according to the King James Version, that the word God is intended to be plural is evident in the statement, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Here, of course, God should be read Elohim, the creator, but the word said, in each case is to be inferred not to speak, but to will, or to inwardly determine. The same thought that is implied in the Tibetan creation, when the worlds are formed by the meditation or the inward mental determination of the Dhyanis. In the Gnostic writings, it is described that the builders each gave to man a certain part of their own nature so that when he was finally completed, he participated in all of the universal powers and, in addition, possessed the life of the Eternal Father and Soul, the Boundless.
the pre-Adamic man, the condensation of the earth from its nebulous fire mist state required many millions of years. In those ages, there was no time with which to measure the infinite processes. Time is man-made. At last, the body of our planet was formed with the surface of the earth in a molten state and vapor surrounding the whole planet. The earth was not habitable by any creatures that man has recollection of. Although it is taught in old records that fantastic beings drifted about in the flames, the physical globe floated in a sea of superphysical humidity, termed by the Greeks ether. This gives us the origin of the primitive belief that the continents of the earth floated in a great sea. This ether was not physical humid vapors arising from the earth's surface, but the vital ethereal element in which were evolving the forms that were later to descend upon the earth as species and races of living things. Most of the ancient philosophies teach that life descended onto the physical planet from some sphere of superphysical energy which encloses the physical planet. Curiously enough, this old opinion survives, and recent stratosphere explorations have discovered living spores in the stratosphere. A number of scientists have come to the conclusion that space may contain these spores, which, like drops of condensing water, represent seed lives oozed out of the etheric body of the earth. It is too soon to say what will be the final opinions of scientists upon this matter, but it is also entirely too soon to declare the ancient philosophers to be wrong. Bema, the German mystic, describes the celestial Adam who dwelt not upon the earth, but in the heavens, a term which may infer this etheric diffusion. Certainly the ancients believed that even the process of incarnation infers the descent of the superphysical principles of man from a humid sphere outside of the earth. This humidity is described by the old mythologist as a river which divides the earth from the outer universe. To the pagans, this river was the Styx, and to the Christians, it is the Jordan, with its host of the redeemed gathered upon the distant shore. The Greek poets wrote of the herds of souls floating in the mist, which divides the world of the living from the world of the dead. By the world of the living as simply meant the physical plane, and by the world of the dead, the superphysical, subjective universe. Although in fact, the opposite would be more nearly true. In the biblical story, man dwelt in a paradisiacal sphere before his fall into the mystery of generation. This paradisiacal sphere is called a garden and has been variously located by religious enthusiasts upon almost every part of the earth's surface. Eden is not, however, on the earth's surface, but above it, or more correctly, in the high etheric element which encloses the earth in a globe of translucent energy. The four rivers are the four streams of ether or energy, which sustain the four kingdoms of the physical world, mineral, vegetable, animal, and human. Man physically is nourished by the vital ethers of nature. These ethers now work through him, but in pre-adamic times, he possessed no physical body, and these ethers formed an etheric body. In the midst of Eden was a small area which was termed paradise. The ancients believed this to represent approximately the North Pole area of the etheric globe which, like the physical globe, possessed polarity. The study of cell life shows that impregnated cells develop first from their north polar caps, and the same is true of planets in all of the cosmic planes. The first connection between the etheric plane and the physical was polar. Therefore, physical life, moving downward from the etheric state, flowed particularly to the poles, which were the first parts of the physical Earth's surface to crystallize. It is therefore stated that in ancient times, millions of years ago, the gods brought the seeds or germs of life first to the Earth's polar cap. The descent of the gods is described in Genesis 6 2, where the sons of God saw the daughters of men and took unto themselves wives. 
By this we are to understand that the cooling of the earth's surface resulted in the liberation of elements. These elements, moved by the will of the gods, gradually assume forms and patterns, even as the impregnated cells gradually builds an organism capable of sustaining individual intelligent existence. In the very ancient times, the first bodies were such as air and water. From these responded most easily to the pulses of the creating will. When the vehicles or bodies built up first from the more subtle parts of the physical globe reached a certain degree of development, the spirits dwelling in the ether above and called in the Bible the sons of God flowed downward and into the new bodies, which are called the daughters of men, or more correctly, the daughters of manas, or mind, the mind, formed bodies. For the word man literally means mind. While dwelling in the paradisiacal state, the entities which we now know as men were androgynous. As in explicitly stated, they were created male and female. In the old Kabbalah, they are described as having been formed back to back a male and female organism. More correctly, it is to be inferred that they possessed inwardly the potentialities of both positive and negative powers. The Edenic Garden contained not only the rudiments of human existence, but also the other kingdoms which were to manifest. It was therefore a sort of superior earth in which forms of life developed and prepared themselves for physical incarnation. Even as the wise in this world are building superphysical bodies in which to function when the race has finished its physical evolution, the name given to the order of life, which was to incarnate as human, was Adam, which means species, type, or kind. Never for a moment does it infer a single individual. Adam, therefore, correctly means a mode of consciousness, a type of mind as distinguished from the animal and vegetable kingdoms, which did not possess individualized intelligence and therefore are properly termed species. These lower kingdoms have a center of consciousness called a monad, whereas man has evolved his monad into an ego, or a center of I amness. The process of man's entry into physical existence, or the birth of the terrestrial atom was preceded by an elaborate evolutionary program. Forms were built up in the material world by process of natural experimentation. These forms were not habitable by creatures possessing mind, and they passed away in the laboratory of evolution. It was also after hundreds of millions of years of growth and development that forms were generated suitable to the manifestation of the celestial atom. The forms which were not used, called the mindless, the shadows, and the monsters, are described by Barosis in his Chaldean history as composite beings made up of animals, birds, and fishes, with many heads. They are also referred to in the Kabbalah as the kings of Edom, the unbalanced giants who perished in the void. In chapter 6, 4th verse of Genesis, it says, there were giants in the earth in those days. At last, by the working of nature from below upwardly, forms were organized through which the human life wave could come into manifestation. When this process had been consummated, man's consciousness descended into a specially prepared part of what appeared to be the animal kingdom, whereupon this kingdom branched off definitely from the true animal kingdom resulting in the scientific perplexity concerning the missing link and the origin of human individuality. Such are a few of the reasonable conclusions sustained by the ancient commentaries and cosmological systems to be derived from the early chapters of Genesis. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.